Welcome to the Bible and Theology Matters podcast, where we discuss all things Bible and theology. Because it matters. What you really believe determines how you really behave. Now, here is your host, Associate Professor of Bible Exposition at Dallas Theological Seminary and Professor of Bible and Theology for the National Theological College and Graduate School, Dr. Paul Weaver. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is when you are listening to this podcast. I'm your host, Paul Weaver, and today we have a very special program for you. I am recording this podcast from Jeju Island, an island just off the mainland of South Korea, and it is controlled by South Korea. I'm here this week teaching the book of James at the Word of Life South Korea Bible Institute. I have 24 students who are from South Korea, Japan, China, Taiwan, Canada, and the United States. These students have devoted this year to knowing the Word of God and to knowing the God of the Word. To learn more of how you can earn college credits and receive a wonderful international experience at the Word of Life South Korea Bible Institute, please visit wobijeju.org. That's Wolby for Word of Life Bible Institute, W-O-L-B-I, Jeju, J-E-J-U, dot org. Being here on Jeju Island provides me with the unique opportunity to have a very special guest on the podcast, my friend and former colleague, Steve Nichols. Steve is the founding director, executive dean, and resident professor of the Word of Life Bible Institute here at Jeju Island in South Korea. Steve has served with Word of Life for 35 years. He is the field director for Word of Life Jeju Island and loves to coach younger staff. Steve is a graduate of the Word of Life Bible Institute in New York earned a bachelor's degree from Liberty University in cross-cultural communication. He has a master's degree in religious education from Cornerstone University and also a second master of arts degree in religion from Asia Baptist Theological Seminary. Steve, welcome to the Bible and Theology Matters podcast. Well, Paul, it's really good to be with you. It's a joy to have you as a guest lecturer, teacher here with our students and just a, a joy to be here with your audience. I'm just thrilled. Steve, as you know, the name of this podcast is Bible and Theology Matters. Steve, why do you believe that the Bible and theology really does matter? Well, the Bible matters because God said it does. <laughs> and 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and it's profitable. It matters. It's profitable for doctrine, for teaching, for reproof. For correction for training in righteousness so we like to say it teaches you what's the right way and it shows you the wrong way and it shows you if you get off path how to get back on the right way and it shows you how to stay on the right way and all of that is not just theoretical it's very practical and it has practical effects for our everyday life so knowing god's word can have a huge impact on your everyday life. And theology is just the outflow of that. Theology is the teaching, the doctrine from the Word of God. So what does God say are the most important things that we need to know? And the stuff that is most important to him, he's going to repeat over and over and make it clear and simple. And then the next things are also going to be there to search and find and study and do together. And you never can come to the end of it. So you can do this at every stage of life. The Word of God can impact you as a, a child, as a teen, as a single, as a young adult, as a married person. And then later, as you get older, every time you read it and study it, it can have new applications and you can see it in fresh new ways, even though the teaching doesn't change, but the practical application does. So you can never get to the end of it. You'll never run dry. And it is so refreshing, fulfilling, and so practical. In today's program, we are going to discuss the importance of Bible and theology in a South Korean context. So would you describe the average level of biblical literacy amongst the normal or regular Christian here in South Korea? Wow, that's a really interesting question, and there's many ways to look at it. But if you're a normal church member, an average person who attends church in Korea, probably similar to the Western world, you would hear all the stories of the Bible. Most of the main ones you would know. Most of the famous parts of the Bible you would know. And so in that sense, people would think we're literate because we understand from Genesis to Revelation, lots of what's going on in the Bible. And it's easy for a response to be, yeah, 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 I know that, I know that. So that would be a typical person. On the flip side, 
I would say the teachings of the Bible, especially the intellectual knowledge of the Bible, and being able to argue or discuss theological questions is not high on the priority list of pretty much the whole culture. So even if you're attending seminary, more important than that is practically how can you lead a church successfully? How can you do practical ministry? How can you help people? And there's so much required of a Korean pastor. They're having to be at every wedding and funeral and building dedication and baby dedication and visit every church member and during the year. And there's just all of these layers of expectations of a Korean pastor that he honestly has very minimal time for study of the word of God to give meat, being able to explain the word of God, especially to go verse by verse and be able to unfold and share the word of God in that way. It's honestly a rarity to do it that way. Um, so yeah, they usually the guys who are the pastors are pretty good at speaking, motivating an audience, being able to feel the audience, but to be able to be a good spiritual chef and deliver the spiritual meals of the word of God in a way that's both the intent of the original author and practically how does that apply to our life here in this context today, that has been a weakness, that piece of it. And most pastors would just shake their head in regret and say, I wish I had more time, but I'm too busy. I can't make that happen. So Steve, what are some of the areas of theology that are significantly and adversely affected by the lack of biblical literacy here in South Korea? Well, if you just took systematic theology, so systematic theology, there's basically been 10 groupings to say, what do I believe about God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, man, angels, sin, salvation, the Bible, the church, future events, those categories. Most of those categories, people wouldn't think much about. They haven't spent much time thinking about that. But one that would be big would be eschatology. Pretty much in the Korean church, eschatology is missing. So there wouldn't be a teaching about the future events and the Lord's return. We have lots of pastor's kids who attend Walby. We would ask them, have you ever heard a message from the book of Daniel or teaching through the book of Daniel or from Revelation, teaching through the book of Revelation. It's almost non-existent. And they're excited to learn and they know the Lord's promised he's going to return, but they don't know much about it. So that would be a missing piece. The others you'd get a little bit here and there, but for eschatology, it's pretty much missing. The charismatic issues, it's interesting because when I came in 1988, 1990, in that time period, I would say it was not pro-charismatic. It was not anti-charismatic. The whole country was pretty much a don't ask, don't tell about the charismatic issues. So there would be people who would be pushing, seeking to discover your gifts of speaking in tongues or healing, and they would be seeking after that. But the pastors and the churches didn't say yes, didn't say no. They would let it happen if it happened in the church, but they wouldn't make it an issue for the Sunday morning time. And then you would have some people in your churches who would be pushing it. So come to a special meeting and we're going to, and then those they recruited would come to that. And that was kind of done on the side. But there came a time, and actually when I was a student going to language school, one of my classmates was a German girl who had married a very famous pastor here in Korea. And in that church, that church grew to 60,000 members, so it was huge. <laughs> it so happened as I was in language school, they had a traditional style English service, and it had about 60 people. And the English pastor was a Westerner, and he suddenly died of a heart attack. And so the girl Esther in our class said to, turned to me and said, could you fill in and be our English pastor for three months while we're looking for a new pastor? And her husband would drive us back and forth to language school some days. And I had conversations in the car and we talked about this issue. They were trying to figure out what they were going to do. And it ended up at that time, three of the largest churches in Korea were in a joint conference 
with thousands of pastors. And one of the key leaders turned to the other and said, why are you limiting the work of the Holy Spirit by doing a don't ask, don't tell policy? We need to push this from the pulpits and go public with it. And since it was done in front of thousands of churches, even though it was somewhat embarrassing and an awkward moment at that time, but I can point back at that time as a key moment that it changed from just being a don't ask, don't tell situation to now it was being pushed by a large group. And so then you had a lot of result from that. Yeah. So in the West, we do like if people learn how to speak in tongues, they'll go to a conference and somebody may teach them. I've watched videos of guys saying, uh, talk like a baby, repeat this over and over, say it faster, say it faster. But in Korea, it's more mimicking others. So I've been in churches that they would have a prayer meeting before to go and speak. And we would be all holding hands and they're all praying in Korean and we're all praying together. And then suddenly I realize it's not Korean anymore. It's a repeating sound. And so at that moment, I would just open my eyes. And on two different occasions, the back door would open and somebody new would enter the group and they would feel awkward. Should I come in or not come in? And then they'd see their friend. So they would go over to where their friend was. They would break the circle. They would grab hands and they would look at their friend and try, look, try, look, try, look, try. And five minutes later, the same sound is coming out of their mouth as their friend's mouth. So that is a typical way that people get into it from having not done it before. And so they're just mimicking and seeking to do that. Yeah. Steve, are there any other areas where... As a whole, you would say that there's practical challenges in the Korean church because of a lack of biblical literacy or just bad theology. Well, it's hard to be critical because we, uh, the more you are with another culture, you also realize uh, weaknesses in your own. <laughs> but I guess you could say, what about the church? What about ecclesiology? And this is a practical thing, but it fits theologically as well. In the Korean church, basically, who becomes the deacons and the elders? And what are their roles? Is it really following a biblical model? Really, the number one priority in the Korean church to become an elder and deacon is age. And you'll have 70% of your congregation who are expected and become elders and deacons. So why do they give them those roles? Well, they know if they're an elder or deacon, they'll tithe and they'll be obligated to do stuff in the church. So there's a whole system to pressure that to happen. So when you're in your 30s, then it's to be a deacon. And when you're in your 40s, it's to be an elder. So, oh, I can't be an elder. I'm not old enough to be an elder yet. And it's not biblical qualifications. And some of those people, they're not taught biblically. Here's what the role of that is. And here's why I should do that. So there's that in ecclesiology. Another thing that you would find awkward in the West is tithing in the Korean church. It's typical, it's very common, that if you tithe, your name gets put in the bulletin. So last week's list of all the people who gave money is in the bulletin. And the pastor will, in his prayer, pray through that list. So if you didn't, then you don't get prayed for. So that pressure is there. So you could say that's a weakness in theology. What does the Bible teach about giving and why do I give and what's my motivation and how? And so to be able to teach that in a biblical way, and then why do I become an elder and deacon and what's those key roles? So you could say there's great weakness in that training. Do you think this practice is related to a cultural issue that has impacted the church? There are similarities to other things in the culture. So definitely, I would say it's culturally connected more than I don't think they would argue because the scripture teaches this and they would go from a theological or biblical base to teach and say, here's why. No, it's just a practical reason. And if they didn't do this, it would have a huge effect on the church. So the involvement of all the people who are involved and what they're doing and the pressure to have a successful church, to have a growing church, the expectations of the congregation on the pastor to have a growing church. And this is the fastest way, the best way, the traditional way, the way the successful churches are doing it. So it just feeds itself. So is it connected to shame based? It's hard to be black and white. 
because it gets gray, but it's definitely connected to culture. Steve, how have you seen a year of studying the Bible here at the Word of Life South Korea Bible Institute help your students in these areas, practical and theological issues of ecclesiology and eschatology? Yeah, we have students come from all these different backgrounds. They come from pastors who are godly people, who love the Lord, who evangelize, disciple, and train leaders. And many of them have never gone through the Word of God, book by book, verse by verse, to understand God's Word. So we've even had people who've gone through Christian college, gone to seminary, got the, a low-level master's, even got their MDiv, and come to us and say, I've never had a class that actually teaches me through any book of the Bible. And I understand you guys at Word of Life Bible Institute go through most of the books of the Bible verse by verse, and you go through it survey, you go through it theologically, and then a lot of the books you're going through verse by verse through the whole book. I'd love to do that before I become a pastor. I think it would be hugely helpful for me. So that's one key piece that's been missing that we fill a gap in that way. And then it's done in a practical way. At Word of Life Bible Institute, it's study, life, and ministry together. So the study part is just piece of it. Life together, how do I live the Christian life with a cross-cultural environment, with people from other nations and languages doing this together, and then get involved in ministry so I'm actually applying in ministry the things that I'm doing as well. So in all of those areas, there's lots of growth and people have opportunity. The opportunity to ask questions and ask why and discuss, those opportunities happen. And with the guest lectures who come and teach, one thing about it is we're a small school, so we'll have 30 students and professors who come in. So you get to eat lunch together. After class, you get to have conversations together. So there's opportunity to ask all of those questions. And even in class, we try to make it interactive so that that's possible. And through that, students are saying, then do you mean this is really what it is? We want to be careful. I think a lot of times in Bible school and in seminary, we think that the students already understand the basics. And so we want to teach new things on the side that are, these are the things maybe they didn't know. But the danger of that is students can come out of such a school thinking minor things are major and major things are minor. And not knowing, I call it three-dimensional theology. What are the things I'm willing to die for? What are the things I would work on the same team together with somebody for? And what are the things that I still believe, but I could disagree and be on the same team together? Knowing those differences is huge in your practical life and future. And so as we teach students and they have these aha moments, we try to do it in such a way that we're not teaching some brand new things that nobody else is talking about, but we are teaching the basic things and then clarifying so people will know that's really, really important and here's why. And these things would be lesser so. For our listeners, it is good for them to know that many of your students that come to the Bible Institute here in South Korea, many of them come to faith in Christ as a result of your English programs here in South Korea, Taiwan, and Japan. Would you tell us more about this unique method of reaching young people with the gospel of Christ and why the Bible Institute is so important for their next steps? There's a long story in how this all started, but the short version is that we tried a lot of the traditional word of life type ministries when we first came to South Korea. Bible clubs in local churches, camps, planning to start a Bible institute, and desirous to receive, train, and send missionaries from a very needy, needy part of the world. We're within a an hour flight to all kinds of cities in Japan and China and Taiwan, and some of the 1040 window were actually in that window, but in an area with countries nearby that have great needs. And so as students were coming, we, as we tried these traditional methods, it wasn't a felt need in the church, but pastors were begging us to teach them English. To be honest, in high school, I hated English. I always said, I ain't no good in English. And every day people were asking me, can you teach English, teach my son English, teach this person English? And I said, I'm not an English teacher. I'm here to evangelize, disciple, train leaders. I don't teach English. And one day a Korean pastor said to me, Steve, 
you have a toolbox with hand tools and a power tool. Why do you refuse to use the power tool? You're trying to train pastor's kids and you can't get time with them. But if you opened up an English school, the pastors would send their sons to you and you could have them all week and you could train them and everything you're trying to do, you could do in that environment. And then on the weekends, they're going to be working with the youth. Why don't you think about that and pray about that? It was so hard for me to change that. My study in college was cross-cultural communications. You had to speak the heart language of the people to really minister to them. And one day I went to a missionary training program run by Koreans in Seoul. And for the first time in my life, I saw a program. They had done this for missionary candidates. The missionary candidates had already been through training, had already got their master's degree, had already chosen their country, had lots of degrees. They were in their early 40s, but they realized if I go to this country and serve, I'll learn that language. But if I don't know English, I can't speak to the broader community of missionaries. I'll be alone by myself and I won't have access to all the tools and resources in English available. All these schools said, you need to go back and for one year study English in this environment. So I went to this school. They asked me to teach on the family. And so for one hour a week, I was coming and I sat in a chapel and I saw a Korean student stand up, preach a 10 minute message. And I saw students in the audience with tears in their eyes, moved by what that person said. And I never realized until that moment that you could touch the heart of somebody in a second language. And when that I became aware of that, I thought, oh, my goodness, it can work. I thought I would be handicapped in ministry by doing English ministry. It actually can be a power tool in the toolbox. And we changed and we were able to start a program, a discipleship training program, not for 40 year olds, but for college students in their 20s to learn English and be discipled at the same time. And it ended up becoming both a discipleship training school, we would call a DTS, and an evangelistic tool because even non-believers heard about it, wanted to come. And I could tell you story after story of students who both became Christians at that program and those who grew and ended up going out as missionaries all over the world from that program. We have over a thousand graduates of SYME, the School of Youth Ministries in English, first started in Korea opened up in Japan and also in Taiwan. There would be like grammar and pronunciation and reading and writing, but it was using the Bible and discipleship topics as the topic. So the conversation is not Jack and Jill went up the hill, but Jesus went with Matthew and Mark and here's what they did. And so you took the same idea, but you did it through the scriptures. And we had a couple who had graduated from Columbia International University with their master's in teaching English as a second language who came and actually wrote the curriculum for the English side. I wrote the discipleship side and together we created this program and it was amazing, wonderful ministry. In the beginning, we were trying to meet the needs of pastor's kids. So lots of pastors wanted to send their children to us. And when we opened it up, we only advertised through the churches and pastors. And then they started sending others as well. And then we got asked the question, could we accept an unbeliever? Well, we had never thought about that. This was a discipleship training school. But actually, in the middle of a discipleship training school, if, it, if it's done right, it's great to teach everybody how to do evangelism at the same time. And Korean culture is a little bit different than Western culture. And I had the fear of what if you get unbelievers who are all there and they're arguing with you over what you're trying to teach and it becomes an us versus them mentality. And in the West, if you had quite a few unbelievers in the class, that easily could happen. But in Korean culture, it doesn't happen like that at all. And the students who come are true seekers. And when they're asking questions, it's not to argue, it's they want to know. When I was in the U.S. before coming here, I used to go to Word of Life events and even spoke at some of the basketball marathons or some of the evangelistic outreaches. And in a half hour, you'd have all these like 500 high school basketball players sitting on the floor and they've been playing games in a tournament. And for a half hour, you're sharing the gospel. And we used to say you would till the soil, plant the seed, fertilize, put the water in, harvest all in a 30 minute message because you'd see people come to Christ. And God did use that. There were many people who made decisions to trust Christ. And the churches who brought them were the purpose was that they would follow them up. And that didn't always happen. And so I'm not saying that was wrong. There was a lot of people 
would look back as that was the time God changed their life. But here, because we had students for four to eight months, and it was a dormitory living situation, we lived together, eat together, study together, we're always together. We never had a time where we said, bow your head, close your eyes. How many of you, if you were to die today, you know you'd go to heaven, raise your hand. And if you don't, would you do it today? We just kept teaching the Word of God, sharing the gospel, teaching the Word of God. But almost every week, a student would come to my office, nervously look at me and say, would it be okay if I became a Christian? And when that happened, you knew it wasn't because you told a tear-jerking story. It wasn't because their friend was pressuring them. Hey, when are you going to become a Christian? When are you going to become a Christian? It was because they had been studying the Word of God. They realized what was true, and it burdened their heart, and they wanted it, and they're coming to say. And when that happened, their life did a 180. So I said, it's like having a fruit basket, and you're underneath the fruit tree waiting for the fruit to drop in your basket. Such a joy every time that happened. Oh, it bring tears to my eyes every time. And to be involved in that kind of ministry, it was incredible. Yeah, we calculated about 70% of those. And even those who did not knew the gospel. We had a few who came like from a Buddhist background. Their, their parents were really strong Buddhists. And if they had come out and said, I'm a Christian and I'm going to church and I'm going to follow, they would have been disowned by their family. That was that strong. And they told me this. They said, I'm not going to publicly become a Christian now. But as soon as my parents die, I'm going to become a Christian. What did that mean? Well, one, they knew the gospel forwards and backwards, and they could explain it to others. So even though we didn't count them as they trusted Christ, the idea is they knew and they had a good taste of what is the gospel, what is Christ. Amazing stories. I could tell you one. I don't know if you'll have time for it or to cut it out, but we had a guy, his name was Stefan. He had gone to what we call the Yale University of Korea at Yonsei University, where I attended language school. And he wanted to take a year off. He was not a believer. He was from the country, kind of a country boy, but very smart, gotten like a full ride scholarship to go to the, this top school and wanted to study the Bible for a year. So he had heard about it. So he came to our school and Every couple months, we would do what we call Love Your Neighbor Day, and we would take students out into the streets with a little questionnaire, 10 questions called a short spirituality survey. What do you believe about God, Jesus, the Bible? Has the church helped you, hurt you? And at the end, it gave them an opportunity. Would you like to know more about what we're sharing, more about God, more about how you could have a relationship with God through Jesus? Yes, no, right now, by email. So there would be a way to respond at the end. And whatever they said, we would never pressure them. It was always give them a treat of something and say, thank you for doing the survey. And uh, if you want the results and give us your email, we'll send you back the results of the survey that we're asking many students. Anyway, one day the unbelieving students went out and did this too. So here we are out in the streets. Stefan was with a group of people. And the first person he did the survey to got to question 10 would you like to know more? And they said, yes, now. Well, of course, he's not a believer. So he has to, at that moment, call a Christian friend over and say, I need your help. And that friend then shared the gospel with this person on the street, and they trusted Christ. So he's standing there watching. He watches it all happen. And then when they're done, he goes back. Now he's got to meet the next person. And he meets the next person, gets down to question 10. Yes, now. He has to call his friend back. The first three people he met that day trusted Christ. It's not usual to have that much of response, especially in Korea. The response is not like in the Philippines. You get 10 times more response, but it just so happened. That's how God works. And then we went back that day in the afternoon, came back to the school, and we had a sharing time. And it was kind of candlelight service. You would light your candle and you'd share stories. In the middle of that, Stefan raised his hand and said, can I just say something? He said, I've been here at the school for five months. And he said, you guys have been really patient with me. You've answered all my questions. And today I go out in the street and in just a short period of time, these guys make the most important decision they have to make in their life. And they're willing to give their life to Christ and to trust him, not by pressure. They really saw it and wanted it. And I asked myself, why am I so stubborn? What's taken me so long? And he paused and he said, I think I'm ready. And I'd never done this before. I'd always led people to Christ individually, not in front of a group. But he's saying this publicly in front of the whole group. And I said, Stefan, you know the gospel forwards and backwards. You could share it with people. You know what you need to do. Why don't you just do it right now? 
and publicly in front of that group of staff and students, 50 people, he prays to receive Christ in front of the crowd. The next story is that there were five other guys in that room who hadn't trusted Christ yet. And they watched Stefan trust Christ and become a Christian. And within a few days and weeks, most of those guys also gave their heart to Christ as well. It was such a joy to be in the middle of that. I will never forget just the power of the gospel, the power of the word of God, watching lives change in front of you. That's the best. In the early days, when we first started, we didn't have a Bible Institute here, and we were sending about 30 a year to the U.S. And then from New York, they said, you guys need to start your own Bible Institute there on the island, and there's special needs in that part of the world. In our Bible Institute here, we have students from Korea, Japan, Taiwan, the U.S., Canada. So it's about a third Korean, about a third U.S. passport holders or North American passport holders and about a third from other countries around the world. And together, I think it's a little taste of heaven, but it's all done in English. So some people think, oh, if I went there, would it be in Korean? No, they've gone to the English program first or they've passed their TOEFL test and then come into an English only Bible Institute. So we do it together. And after that, many of them go on to the second year in New York or go on to other Christian evangelical schools in the U.S. or even in some other countries as well. As many of our listeners may be aware, the South Korean church presently is one of the greatest missions sending countries in the entire world. However, we see some concerns among the next generation of Korean Christians that may change all of that. Would you please explain? In the last five years, youth ministry in the Korean church has dropped off a cliff. So many, many young people are leaving the church. This is true in small and mid-sized churches, and it's true in large churches. It used to be, as a ministry of Word of Life, if we came to the Korean church and asked if we could help with youth ministry, the churches didn't sense a need of help. So some of the difficulty for us in the beginning was the Korean church didn't feel they needed help from abroad. They thought, we're doing it pretty well. The big thing right now is everybody knows it's a need. And they're praying and concerned, very concerned with the future of the Korean church. And so this is becoming a hot topic. The Korean church is discussing among itself and any help that we can do together. And it's not just a problem in Korea. It's a problem worldwide that's happening. The Korean church was built at a time when there were a lot of people who came to church came because of need. It might have been handicap need. It might have been somebody went bankrupt. There's a financial need, but they're at a crisis in their life, have no place else to turn. And the church was there to help. Even during the Korean War, it was also the biggest place to go for entertainment. You wanted to hear some exciting stories from the Bible. You wanted a fun time that you could play games and do things together. You wanted some nice snacks that you normally couldn't eat during the week. Go to church. They'll offer all of that for you. And now the Korean country has done a remarkable economic boom. It went from one of the poorest countries in the world in the 1950s to in one generation being a top 10 richest country in the world and did it in one generation on the backs of the grandparents of today. They were the ones who worked double hard to make it happen. And as a result, they became wealthy and therefore had little need and so all their needs are taken care of. They got money. It's changed the feeling. Why do I need God? Why do I need anything? I can do it myself. And so young people, all of them from the time almost they're born, have cell phone in their hand. They're entertained by all kinds of animation and videos. And they've got a thousand things to keep them busy. As a result, they don't see a need for church. In the past, the reason to go to church was to get felt needs met. It really wasn't rooted in the gospel and the reason that God matters, the reason the scriptures matter, and it's practical. It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor. You need this gospel the same, and it affects you. In fact, in some ways, when you're rich, it's harder because you're tempted stronger and you have pulled in many directions. So why do I need God both 
as a wealthy person and as a poor person. But then the generation, as they go away from the Lord, it gets really messy and there's all kinds of problems. And so the problems mount. And again, people don't know where to turn. So it's important in this generation, even though the numbers are smaller, to train people to be ready because the needs are growing fast and great. It's like a house of cards that's going to crumble. And we need to have solid Christians who are able to help and to counsel and to work with those because we all are needy. All of us are a mess. All of our families are a mess. We're all needy people. We never can get independent where we don't need God. Clearly, the Bible and theology is very important to you and the staff of Word of Life South Korea. Tell us a little more about what you are seeking to accomplish with the Bible Institute here. So we've talked about it biblically and theologically, why it's important to know God's Word in a practical way. There's another layer that comes with this, and that is experientially, there's a cross-cultural element. See, we're together many different cultures and languages. The Korean church grew up and Koreans grew up in a one language, one culture, one people country. 99.99% of the people here are Korean. So if you come into the country and you're on a flight, you could be the only non-Korean on that flight. The flight between Kimpo and Jeju is the most traveled flight between two cities anywhere in the world for the last five years. And there's lots of either Koreans or sometimes Chinese on that flight. But So Koreans grew up not being international. So in America, we're a United Nations country. So all these countries together. And so we're used to that. But here in Korea, that's unusual. So at our school, there are people who are considering getting involved in mission, getting involved in ministry without having a cross-cultural experience. There's something lacking that many mission agencies say, we need people to have this experience to be, yes, it's good to learn the Bible and practically, but also do that in an environment that's a cross-cultural aspect. And by doing that, it's amazing. Everybody learns. We think it's a little taste of heaven because in heaven, we're all got all the nations will be there, every tribe, tongue, and nation. Here together, we are totally mixed with people from Korea, Japan, Taiwan, the US and Canada, It's all in English, so we're able to understand each other, but we're able to learn how to live together in a God-honoring, pleasing way, and it also changes the way you see others and you see the world, and it makes for a better missionary. It makes for a better, even if you're going to serve not in a full-time pastor or missionary capacity. We had a guy from Taiwan whose father owns five hotels. And he's now back in Taiwan being trained to be the CEO of these five hotels. But he's now discipling and evangelizing and working with the youth in his area in the city of Kaohsiung that has less than 1% Christian. So even though he's not a full-time pastor or missionary, the things he learned here, he was able to use. We had one guy from Japan. And when he came back, he told me this. He said, Steve, the thing that really helped me about going to Wobi Cheju was three things. Number one, he said, in the Japanese church, it's not like a family. People attend church and they leave, but they don't do it together. But at Walby, I learned that the Christian life is done in community. And I want to bring that family spirit that I learned at Walby back to my church in Japan and that community life there. Number two, he said, in Japanese, we have very few tools in our language to be able to train people in Christianity. But with English, there's millions of materials available. So by me learning English, going abroad to study, I now have a huge toolbox of resources that I have access to that I'm able to use for my future ministry. It's invaluable to me. And then third, he said, in Japan, as one culture, we often only see things through a Japanese lens. But by being together in an intercultural community, I was able to see outside of my Japanese box, there's other ways to think about this. There's other ways to see the scripture, apply it. And this is how it's applied in different cultures. So when I come back to my church in Japan and I'm leading the church, when they say, we got a problem, what do we do? We can't solve it. I'm able to say outside of that box, there's some other things. Let me share with you. Those three things were so invaluable 
not only, yes, the Word of God, I learned, I was able to use that as a toolbox to teach, but also those three areas. And I thought, wow, that was really powerful and good. And for Westerners to come and experience this in an Asian culture together, they'll never forget this year. The things that they learned are so invaluable to them. So it's a really neat experience that way as well. Well, thank you. Our time is up for today's program. Steve, thank you for taking the time to help me and our listening audience better understand the biblical and theological needs of the South Korean church and the important part that the Word of Life South Korea Bible Institute or Word of Life Jeju Bible Institute is playing to meet those needs. And to our listeners, please join us again for next week's podcast. We release a new podcast every Thursday morning. We have wonderful discussions about all things Bible and theology with Bible scholars and Bible expositors. If you've enjoyed today's program, please like it and subscribe to it on whatever podcast platform where you download your podcasts. Also, if you enjoyed this program, you may also benefit from our Faith Affirming Findings videos. These are 6-10 to ten minute videos that discuss discoveries from the field of biblical archaeology that affirm the historicity of scripture and silence the critics. You can view those videos on our YouTube channel. Just go to youtube.com forward slash the at sign Bible and Theology Matters, all spelled out, B-I-B-L-E-A-N-D, Theology Matters, or go to our website, bibleandtheologymatters.com and click on the YouTube link. Well, that is it for this week's podcast, but until next time, never forget, the Bible and theology matters, because what you really believe determines how you really behave. Bible and Theology Matters podcast is a listener-supported podcast devoted to helping Christians grow in their knowledge of the Word of God and in their relationship to the God of the Word. To learn how you can partner with the Bible and Theology Matters podcast, visit us at BibleAndTheologyMatters.com. That's Bible, A-N-D, TheologyMatters.com.